I'm Rip Stolfi with a special Poultry Keepers Podcast announcement. I'm happy to tell you that the new Poultry Keepers Podcast Facebook group is now a reality. Mandlin, John, and I wanted to create a place for our growing community of small flock poultry keepers. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just embarking on your poultry adventure, this is the place to be. We want this to be more than just a Facebook group. We want it to become a community brought together by a shared love for poultry and a place you can freely discuss every aspect of poultry keeping. Our new Facebook group is your space to access more information, connect with other poultry keepers, ask questions, and to share your experiences. It's a judgment-free zone where everybody's contribution is valued. Our group will only grow stronger with each new member. So let's foster a culture of learning, sharing, and supporting each other on our poultry keeping adventures. Our tagline says it all. Talking poultry from feathers to function. To find our new group, just go to Facebook and search for Poultry Keepers Podcast. We hope to see you there soon. Now, let's get on with today's episode. Hi, I'm Mandolin Royal, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Poultry Keepers Podcast. Joining me in the studio are John Gunterman and Rip Stalvey, the rest of our podcast team, and we're looking forward to visiting with you and talking poultry from feathers to function. Can you get big results from a small start? Can great results be obtained with only a small flock of foundation birds? Is it possible to build a quality flock without raising 100 or more birds each year? Coming up, we're going to dive into this topic and we're going to share our thoughts. And we also have quite the little list of questions to ask you guys too. That's right, Mandolin. This episode was was actually prompted by one of our listeners who was asking us that very question. Do you have to start with large numbers of birds or can you do it with a small start? The short answer is yes, you can, but we've always got these annoying little butts that come into a conversation. But. Yeah. Let me start off by telling you a little story of somebody who did it and did it very well. And that's Leroy Jones. He was president of the Rhode Island Red Club when I joined, and I quickly learned that Leroy Jones didn't have to hatch a lot of birds each year. He How would let two hens. He would let two hens set. That's oh. it. That's all the chicks he wanted, and he was extremely difficult to beat in a show. How was he able to do that? He started with extremely high quality birds. He had a real good knowledge of understanding Rhode Island Reds and how to breed them. Now he, these were Bantam, but he started many years prior to that, uh, raising large fowl. He had extremely high standards for his birds and for his flock and for his goals. Actually, they were very high. And the other thing that he did was he adhered to a really strict culling and selection process. Now he may hatch. 20 chicks a year, but out of that, he may keep one or two or three. That was it. And statistically that falls in line with the rule of 10. Yeah, it does. Again, the short answer, we think it's possible, but let's get to some of the buts. I think the first thing you need to do if you're going to try this is ask yourself and do some hard evaluation. Okay. Before you even get started. Ask yourself, is it your first experience raising poultry or breeding poultry? If it is, it's going to take you longer to accomplish getting a good group of birds. That and there's some basic knowledge you have to acquire before you get into a big project too. Like you got to figure out your infrastructure, your husbandry methods, dial in your feeding, even just figuring out incubation and the learning curve there. There's a lot to learn just to get started, let alone taking up a serious venture of breeding. And that's not a bad place for some of those hatchery stock. Get started in them for your first year or two without a heavy investment into your birds and get your husbandry skills worked out. So when you do have those high dollar birds on the ground, you've smoothed over those bumps and worked through it and figured out what's going to work for you in your particular scenario. So another question, 
is, do you know how many birds you can successfully maintain each year? And that is something where it's another thing to learn about as you go through because some breeds need more space than other breeds. Sure. I would start with the hard infrastructure. What are your limits? What do you have for acreage? Or do you have a tenth of an acre or an allotment or a 10 by 10 chain link dog run? And then we're going to size your flock appropriate to what's available to them. And with that, your food and water and everything is going to be sized appropriately. And hopefully it's financially sustainable as well, because uh, we joke about the $3,000 egg. Yeah, that first egg after you've built everything is the most expensive <laughs> egg. Oh my goodness. But you've gotten so deep into it by this point. And if you decide you love it, great time to start doing some research find out what breeds do really well in your area what breeders are in your area that you can tuck up under their wing and glom as much knowledge and hopefully some genetics off of um, and start your journey that's going to lead you to a couple of decisions that you're going to have to make like our third question here do you want to be a breeder or do you want to be a salesperson because the methodology and how you run your flock and what you're doing it for, that there's little differences in there. So you want to be honest. Do you want to do this to make a difference with the breed that you've chosen? Or are you trying to make money? Because there's different things to consider within that. And Madeline, I think that's where so many people who are just starting out run afoul of this whole situation is they get birds, they pay a pretty good dollar amount for them. And then suddenly they think, I'm going to sell eggs or I'm going to sell chicks to make my money back. But there's little thought going into how mm -hmm. am I going to make these birds better to make them more valuable? Consequently, because if you don't have the reputation, you can't charge the same price you paid. No. And, no. and when people do that, the quality of their birds just takes a nosedive. And because they sometimes don't know the basics over and over is people buy two dozen hatching eggs and they think the very next year they're going to be able to sell their pullet eggs for the same amount of money that they paid for their two dozen eggs. But what they don't realize is the decade or decades of breeding and selection that went into those eggs that they got and what they need to do to have a viable product or hopefully have a viable flock. And that's true, John. People who produce high quality birds, those people that I refer to as foundational breeders, they're the ones that other people actively seek out to get quality birds to start their flock. Sure. And uh, they've right. got thousands of hours and thousands of dollars invested mm -hmm. in getting their birds to the point they're at. Lifetimes, lifetimes. And yeah. I think we need to respect that and I think cherish it because that's something that we can't afford to lose. Because these, these birds were bred to do different things than a lot of people are expecting of them now. Dual purpose, having eggs and meat, selecting to a standard. There's not a whole bunch of people doing the whole thing now. And I think no. it's important to get people interested back into it and get our foundational flocks up and running and have a good genetic foundation. And if anything, it just helps insulate the species, the breed, and us from futures, changes, and mm -hmm. resiliency through whatever's coming over the next 50, 100, 200 years, I think is important. The, this was a cornerstone in our nutritional profile for so long. We couldn't have gotten here without these birds, and we can't afford to lose them, especially with a lot of the change and struggles that are looming. Another question folks need to be real honest in asking themselves is do you have the necessary poultry management skill to do this? And I'm not talking about just feeding and water. It goes way beyond that. At what point do you start offering baby chick grit? At what point do you switch chicks from starter to grower? All that information is available, at least from out, our outlets. So we have Jeff Maddox, an awesome poultry nutritionist, doing the live feeds every other week with you and Karen and the quality information is out there. You just need to stay away from the hyperbole in the process. Educate yourself as part of the process. That first 18 months that you're raising your hatchery stock, you should be learning all this. If you listen to the older 
folks who have been doing this a while. They have a decade or more of experience on the ground. The person that you get your birds from, seriously, ask them, how, how, do, these, how do these birds like? What, how do you see them respond well? What should I do? Leverage that knowledge. Don't just use them as a supply for the base genetics because they got them there. They're going to know how at least they feel you should bring them forward and be proud to carry their heritage and their genetics forward. Just expanding on that just a little bit, John, study and ask that person you got your bird from, how do you breed your bird? What yes. steps do you take? And emulate that as closely as you possibly can, because that'll get you down the road much faster than getting birds and basically starting over from scratch with your management and breeding. Well, if they're a quality breeder, they're going to be implying a very strict, uh, close bred, line mm -hmm. bred, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, genetics and have done years and years of selection. And they're going to have the, the proof right there. Otherwise you wouldn't be trying to get their genetics and the better breeders I've found, you really need to pursue sometimes and convince them that they want to sell you their genetics. Uh, I know I have a qualification process where, you know, somebody in Florida or Texas, they don't it's not a great place for a Chanticleer. And I tell them that these birds are not suited for your environment. They can't dissipate the heat. They will have problems. Of honesty that breeders can provide, if they have the best of intentions for their variety, their breeds and what they're doing, they're going to tell you the real story of it. They're not trying to push the sale because if you look at supply and demand, if the supply is greater than the demand they're not gonna necessarily take that time but if they've really honed in their flock and they're really making great strides with them and they really are quality birds that demand that they have is going to be high enough that they do need to get picky on who exactly is going to receive the very limited numbers that they have so they're going to be looking for people who have the infrastructure the know-how the drive the will the passion whatever you want to call it, they're going to look for people who have a similar flock goal to what they've already established in their flock to put them in the right hand. Also, I do want to protect my reputation and my genetics to some aspect, but I want to enable them for success. And I don't want to set anybody up for failure knowingly. So if it's going into a bad environment, I'm going to tell them up front. But ironically, I did find one way that you could be profitable raising heritage poultry. And that is to sell every egg to every person that asks. The yeah. only way to do that is to be an unethical breeder. However, if you're going to take right. it seriously, you're, yeah, it's not going to happen. All of the good breeders that I know to a person are very selective about who they release their birds to. And some people, I know this turns them off, but if you don't approach these folks with the right attitude, with an open attitude, showing that you're willing to learn from them, chances of you getting a hold of their bird are really low. One of the very basic questions that I ask, I, I do have a little questionnaire. It's 10 questions, super simple. Number one is, what is your current feed? And I can tell a whole lot based on that. The response is whatever the least expensive 16% layer on the shelf is versus I am mixing my own feed and I'm supplementing with all the essential amino acids that I know are missing from the 16% layer feed that's on the shelf. Because that's going to have a direct correlation to the performance and the way that the yes. birds form on your farm with your nutrition. If they don't follow that same protocol, they're probably not going to see the same result. And they're probably going to come back to you and ask why. They cannot you possibly achieve the, the same level of genetic expression. Because the, the building blocks, the amino acids, that the building blocks for the proteins aren't available to the birds. There's no way they can achieve what I'm doing here, even next door. We change feed alone, and it completely tips the scales. Nutrition is something that touches every aspect of raising poultry. From, from hatching strong yes. chicks to raising strong chicks, right on through to breeders that have all the nutritional needs met at optimum level so they can start to cycle all over again. I had a long so car ride. People need to know. And I was musing in my head when breeding season starts and when I need to start my nutritional plan for the eggs. 
And I, I was like, okay, so a month before breeding season, I may need to make sure everybody's laying. The rooster's got light, pens got light. Uh, they've got access to all this, but really that's just a month after coming out of the molt. So it's really, I'm preparing for breeding season during post molt care. It really started during molt. pens shed all the abdominal fat and reset their bodies to be able to produce quality eggs. So I just keep backing up as to when breeding season starts. And I, I think I'm at the point now it's the first molt. It's all the time, really. It really is all it's the higher. time. If you're a good breeder, you're always thinking about the next batch of eggs. And that's the point. But you keep coming back and back, and all of a sudden you're back where you started from around the other side of the wheel. We brought that's up right. the concept of the breeding cycle and the breeding wheel before. I think Madeline is exactly right. It never stops. It never stops. It's an ongoing process. It's right. not a seasonal process at all in the long run. And that's the mindset that a successful breeder has to have. They're the person who wants those optimal results. And they, they're a very detail-oriented person. And they, they understand incremental gains and slow, steady progress. And this is not going to be an overnight thing. You're not going to buy a trio and be winning ribbons for the next 10 years. No. If you don't want optimum results, that's not important to you then trying to start a good flock from a small starter bird is extremely difficult, if dark, darn near impossible. But it can be done. And they can. That's, that's why we're here. We don't want to set a fault to false expectation, however. So if, if all these checks in the boxes and you're like, yep, that's exactly what I want to do. I'm down with that. This is the number of birds I can start with. Okay, let's start. You got your list of written goals of what you want to accomplish? All uh, right. Do you have your plan? Let's say that you get all of your ducks in a row. You've got your goals. You've got your plan. You've sourced your birds. You have checked off every single box on the whole beginning of the journey. But the next question, how do you handle adversity and setbacks when a problem jumps up and surprises you? Because even the best laid plans, mother nature, environment, anything like that can come out and ruin it. And yeah, make we, you reconsider things. So how do you handle that if something unexpected arises? Because I've sure. struggled with that personally. Sure. It's almost like if it's not one thing, it's another. This winter has been hugely challenging. We had three weeks in a row where we had heavy, wet snow in uh, late December, early January that took out power for between two and four days per week. So every time that happened, I lost a batch in the incubator. That, that Set, set us back a lot. Um, and we also had a lot of rain and warm weather in late December and early January, which doesn't happen, which woke up the ermine. So we had some predation events very out of season, two months earlier than I would have expected them. Normally I go, oh, February's ending. It's time to put up ermine protection. But no, it got hit in January. Luckily, I had a two-week supply of fertilized eggs that I always keep in reserve as my Oh, darn. Yeah, safe. Insurance eggs. <laughs> but on the heels of three consecutive weeks of power outages and ermine attack, that two-week backup just really wasn't a two-week backup. It was more like five eggs that I found between the four that were there and the one in the next box. That was it. I don't put all my great hens in one place. Uh, that's another thing. If you can separate your breeders physically, uh, it's not a bad idea. If a, a predator gets in, one place, it's not likely they're going to get into the other place. They're probably going to stop there and feast for a little while and not work any harder to get any more food. If they break into one spot, especially with weasels, mink, raccoon, stuff like that will decimate everything in that pen and then nibble and waste the bulk oh, of it. They're yeah. not going to put the effort into breaking into a whole other pen. And well, yeah, they're not going to go further into a, a chicken house. They're going to stop where they've got their kill. They're not going to put any more effort into breaking in further. That's it. And they're just going to sit and nibble. Very true. If you don't think that you're going to have setbacks and adversity, you are so wrong because sooner or later it's going to come up and really hit you hard. So you got to be prepared for those as best you possibly can. Or you will have uh -huh. a major setback. I thought so hard 
that I thought of every contingency. I, my background, folks know I was in the military. I was an intelligence analyst in the Navy. I planned and I planned and I view my chicken as like my junior enlisted. I take it personally <laughs> if a predator gets through. And between my seven joule outer electric fence, my three and a half joule inner electric fence, chain link, poultry wire, which is worthless for everything except very small, weak things like maybe mice. And I am amazed at the holes that predators can get through. Like, how did you get through the size of a quarter? If you can stuff a quarter through it, something that can kill your chicken can get through there. I'm even revising that to a nickel now. Getting to know weasels, they are incredibly adept to getting through very tight squeezes. But if you start looking at even the whole structure of these predators and the bulk of a mature raccoon, but the way that they can fold and contort their body, they actually only need a three inch gap to gain access. Yeah, there. So prepare for that. There, there is heartbreak and death in poultry keeping, not at your hands. At the end of every season, there is freezer camp, and folks need to be prepared for that physically, mentally, emotionally as well. We say culling means removing from the genetic pool and not breeding forward, but culling can also mean the unaliving process. And it exactly. Can be especially aggravating when you come up with your best laid plans and you drop down to just your very best birds, but then perhaps in February, the just turning one-year-old male that you have didn't have that longevity and good vigor in, and he falls over dead right before breeding season. Yeah. He's self-called, and that can set you back an entire season or more if you need to scramble to try to find another one that was just as decent in the traits that the other guy had. Rip, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. You have a breeding method that is more reliant on the female side of all the lines than the male. So you're not as critically injured if you do lose a male. That's exactly right. And, and I'll explain that more as we go along. Great. Just want to get people's whistles wetted. Well, as I, I think when you do have well, to have the setbacks and you have questions coming from that it it goes back to do you have a mentor or someone else that you can turn to for guidance when you hit the little roadblock and i didn't uh, i glommed on to rip and karen and jeff and the whole pk360 years ago i've been a fan forever i've watched every episode multiple times and that, that's what I loved is not having access to a mentor right down the road or just the virtual mentorship, if that's a word, if we can make that. And that's what I'm trying to enable to others. Uh, we want to be a place for reliable information that you can reach out to and it's there it, and it's not hidden behind a paywall. And how can we get you to build a really high quality birds and flock consistency? Well, to be I, supportive and to help people get to success too, because when I first started with poultry, we didn't have these online communities of support and education. It was library books and the advice of whoever you happen to meet. The internet mm -hmm. was not around. So right. adapting to the changes and the entire wealth of information that's now pretty readily available, so mm -hmm. long as you have that internet connection, that's changed a lot. That's changed a lot for the better, but folks need to be aware too. There is a lot. I think it's probably well-meaning, but it's poor quality information out there. And it, it can be difficult to sort through all of that. It can. Just the simple things like my birds don't need grit because I feed pellet or I feed crumble. There, there's a lot of fallacies out there when it comes to nutrition and husbandry and just everything about the bird. Good quality source for information, virtual mentors. Uh, I think that's important. Having a mentor locally, somebody that at least can come by and look at your birds. If you don't have the experience hands-on and Mandolin does an outstanding job explaining how to manipulate the bird and evaluate yes. it, but it's very helpful to have somebody who's handled a couple hundred birds at least come out and show you how to pick up a bird. How do you catch a bird safely to both you and the bird? These are things that we can explain all day long, but unless somebody shows you and helps you figure out a way that is going to work for you and your birds on your property, it can be frustrating. 
and it can be dangerous. I've slipped and fell chasing birds in a wet pen before. And at my age, I shouldn't be slipping and falling. I don't heal as fast. It, it can get fun. Sometimes I'll hear my wife giggling and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I just rewound the security camera footage of your <laughs> little skill. But things like that, security systems are very inexpensive these days. And for under a hundred bucks, you could put cameras in your coop, infrared overnight and on your run. So you can wake up at three o'clock in the morning, pick up your phone or tablet and just push a button and go, oh, yep, there's everybody. I can see them all sleeping. Ooh, what's that moving in the background? I've heard a ruckus and I've looked and saw on the infrared camera. Oh, it's a fox. Yep. They're sniffing around the outside. Okay. They're moving on. I don't need to get up out of bed. And I haven't gone so far as to put cameras inside of the barn. But if you do that and you have a camera inside of a pen, that can answer some questions you might have too. Like if you see that you're not really getting very many eggs and every once in a while you'll see a little wet spot in the nest box where an egg used to be, it can help you get to the bottom of some issues. Like if they are eating eggs or if you put a visual identifying mark on a female, you can watch and see when each one is going into the nest box, who's laying when. Yes. There's a lot of data you can collect just through observation that you're doing remotely. Okay. I'll give you a little tip that I, I made up along the way. And being former realtor, I have a lot of uniforms that have what we called IFF tabs on them, little infrared markers. It was like on our helmet bands, things like that, that I was maybe allegedly put on leg bands. So at night I can see the chickens under infrared very brightly. And by changing the placement of the IR band or the orientation of it, you could individualize the chickens at night under infrared. That's this one. That's the up and down. This is the double up. This is the double down chicken based on the, the level of their stripe. I had predation problems and that was one way of looking at what was happening. Eventually I figured out that mice will come in and they will roll your eggs away in the middle of the day. I had a mouse coming up the ramp and pushing eggs out and down the ramp after the chicken laid it. The chicken would come out making her egg song and I'd be like, okay, I'll come out in about 10 minutes and collect it. And I'd get out there and there'd be no egg. Where'd it go? Yeah, that's definitely a case for uh, cameras to figure out what's going on there. And one thing I want to bring up, and this was something that was really hard for me to deal with first, is are you a patient person? And <laughs> I'll be, freely admit, I years. am not the most patient person in the world. It's going to take years to get there. Oh, it, it's going to take time. It, it's not a quick fix thing. It's not simply as putting a rooster and a hen together and voila, you get dynamite chicks out of it. That's nope. not going to happen. Be prepared to go slow. Be prepared well, to have to be made patient. Most of my poultry problems were my own fault from a lack of patience. Oh, yeah. Been there. Oh, gosh. But I guess it's it, the point where after thinking about all of this, are you the type of person to always strive to learn more so that you can do better? Like as we go and as we figure out what to do, what not to do, just keeping that forward momentum of always learning because you're never going to know it all. No. And getting to the point where I can start concentrating on little annoying things like crooked toes. I'm only selecting for silver down chicks this year. That's my goal because I really want the silver gene in my white birds and I'm not homozygous on both sides for it yet. Once I am, we'll be good. Yeah. You'll get there too. We're close. We're close. That's by paying Very, attention. I've got a week to go. You're a gold down chick or you're a silver down chick. You get a gold band or a silver band on your wing and silver band chicks stay and gold band wings are for sale this year. Another thing I think people need to be really aware of that to pull this off, you have got to be absolutely ruthless at culling through and selecting your, only your better bird. And I know absolutely. this is something that's very hard for new folks to do because they form this emotional attachment to their bird. And that's fine if you do that, but just know if you do that as a breeder, it's really going to hinder your progress. We're not saying put your lesser quality birds in the stew pot as soon as you identify no. them. 
And your females, absolutely, let them carry out their life until they reach the end of their productivity. We're just saying when they're two or three years old, don't breed from them. They're still great layers. Keep their eggs, sell their eggs, eat their eggs. Just don't breed their eggs. Only breed the eggs from your best and only keep your best male, the king, the heir, the spare, maybe a backup or three or four stashed around the neighborhood. I'm very male centric. Rib, you're going to try and help me break out of that mindset. It took me a long time to realize I don't have to put all of the eggs in the incubator. I don't have to hatch from every single female. I don't need to have a bird of every breed. Right now, I'm setting eggs from one and one hen only from my flock. But she's got what I want. I started so organizing by hen into the trays and I set the tray when I have six rows filled from six individual females and then I can hatch accordingly from there. And that way it's going to let me see what each female is producing with the particular male that she's been mm -hmm. with. And it's yes. going to show me if they're worth hatching from again or not because on the science side of things, if you're not sure how they're going to produce, go ahead and hatch and see. And those results are what tell you if it was a good idea and you should do it again, or if it wasn't that great, and don't do it again. Right now, I've got her isolated with the male that I, I'm really interested in. And then I'll dry her out for a month and put her on the other male and see what each hatch, test hatch looks like. See what kind of chicks each male throws through her and then decide what I really want. At the end of the season are the eggs that I'm going to be hatching. Hopefully my keepers are in there. If some keepers come up on the first two test hatches, great. The first three months of her second year is about test hatching and figuring out which male I want to put her with at the end of that season before she molts. This brings us to the close of another Poultry Keepers podcast, and we're very happy you chose to join us. Until next time, we'd appreciate it if you would drop us a note letting us know your thoughts about our podcast. Please share our podcast with all of your friends that keep poultry, and we hope you'll join us again when we'll be talking poultry from feathers to function. Mm -hmm.